right, hello everyone and good morning. Um, thank you for joining us on this very early drizzly day. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who's joining online. Uh, my name is Corinna Turbis and I am the policy director at the Data Foundation. Uh, the Data Foundation is a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank here in Washington, DC, uh, with a mission to improve society through the use of data. Over the last 10 years, our work has grown to include uh, data for evidence building, supporting public health data, among other priorities. Uh, but we got our start, and our data coalition initiative still focuses on uh, improving financial data transparency. Uh, this work has included advocating for the Financial Data Transparency Act, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, um, and other regulations that would require financial regulators to adopt common open source data standards. Uh, and other uh, data modernization initiatives. One of the themes that I've heard throughout this conference is that disclosure and transparency fuel anti-corruption, the anti-corruption fight, and is essential to good governance and preserving democracy. I couldn't agree more. And, uh, but there are many things that go into creating an effective ecosystem of data to help improve anti-corruption. The data uh, certainly won't just appear and it won't appear in a way that is timely and usable. That is why I'm excited for this panel of experts to talk about the data systems needed to support the role of enforcement, enable watchdogs, and integrate with the private sector, and even how policies can help or hurt these efforts. So I'm going to start this session uh, by spending a few moments uh, chatting directly with Brian Miller, the inspe Special Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery, about the role data plays in his work um, and then I will hand the moderator mark over to, uh, to Steve Maizanes of Bloomberg to facilitate a broader conversation uh, with Lakshmi and David as well. We will be sure to include questions at the end and if you are online, please be sure to include your questions in the chat. We'll be having an opportunity for those as well. So without further ado, um, I am going to turn to Brian here and ask him to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about the work you are doing at the Special Inspector General's office. Thank you, uh, Karina, and uh, I guess I'll turn the mic on. Is that right? Do I need to turn it on back there? He's pointing oh, to something. He, he's, you're good. Thumbs up. I'm good. Okay, good. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Karina, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming to listen to us. Uh, but I am the, as Karina said, the Special Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery. It was created by the CARES Act in 2020. Uh, the office was created in that legislation, and I was confirmed by the Senate in April and started in April. Uh, it's an important office. It oversees the uh, uh, programs administered by the Secretary of the Treasury, in, particularly, in particular, particular uh, the direct loans, and the, uh, we do look at the uh, Main Street Lending Program uh, funded by the Department of the Treasury and the uh, Federal Reserve program. I've had a long uh, uh, history in the federal government. I'm currently in the federal government, but uh, I am a lawyer um, otherwise. Uh, so I'm sure, I'm sure you all have other vices, but I'm a lawyer. And um, um, I spent most of my career in the federal government. I worked in the Department of Justice for 15 years. I was fortunate enough to work for many attorneys general, and I worked in the deputy attorney general's office uh, when Larry Thompson was a deputy attorney general. And uh, also, I was an assistant US attorney, federal prosecutor, did all sorts of cases, um, drug cases, fraud cases, um, uh, and uh, uh, one drug-related murder case, as well as uh, uh, many terrorism and terrorist financing cases and uh, argued before many courts in the Eastern District of Virginia, the Fourth Circuit, the Eastern District of New York, and uh, Second Circuit, as well as many other Tenth, Ninth uh, Circuits. Um, court, uh, there are Circuit Courts of Appeal, uh, those, those are lawyers, uh, and it's the second highest court in the land under the Supreme Court. Uh, so I, I've had a very fortunate career in the federal government. I was fortunate to work with so many great lawyers and get assigned to so many great cases. 
And uh, after that, I went into private practice and uh, represented uh, corporations mainly and uh, occasionally individuals uh, in white collar uh, criminal cases. Uh, and then I was called back into the federal government. Uh, I was asked to come and, and serve in the White House Counsel's Office. And from there I went on to be the uh, Special Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery. And this office is important because of the trillions of dollars that went out in the CARES Act. Um, there had to be a mechanism to oversee the money. You know, the federal government, uh, the Congress especially, focused on getting the money out. I guess it depends on where I walk. <laughs> Uh, it, the uh, Congress needed to get the money out quickly to those who were hurting and needed the money. Uh, so they focused on getting the money out quickly. They didn't focus as much on fraud controls, fraud prevention mechanisms, things that, you know, as a fraud fighter, um, oh, I forgot to mention I was uh, the Senate confirmed uh, Inspector General for the uh, General Services Administration for the federal government for about a decade. I just forgot a decade of my life there, um, and um, and did that uh, for many years. Um, but as a fraud fighter, you know, you like to see mechanisms, control mechanisms, auditors like controls. Uh, I did a lot of compliance programs. I devised compliance programs for big corporations and some small ones. Wrote uh, codes of business business ethics which I'm telling you, if, if you haven't read a scintillating novel, you may want to read one of those. Um, but I'm um, just kidding. Uh, but they're important. And uh, so, you know, obviously, from that perspective, um, we would have taken a lot more time. It probably would have been forever. People who needed the money would not have gotten the money. So Congress focused on getting it out, and with good reason. Um, but they also wanted to make sure that the money would be overseen. And so they created uh, what I call an over, oversight architecture. And a primary part of that oversight architecture is creating the Special Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery, and that's my office. And we oversee those programs. We look for people who are abusing the program. Unfortunately, when the government gives out money, many uh, unsavory characters come forward and, and get the money. Many criminal operations and in, in, our, in pandemic re relief, Many criminal organizations pose as uh, uh, needy Americans or corporations, and they get the money. So our job is to find them, prosecute them, bring them to justice, to find, root out fraud, waste, and abuse. And uh, um, it's a daunting program. There's so much money that went out, so many programs, so many different rules. And uh, it has really challenged us in many different ways. Um, I was telling my daughter on the way up that uh, in law enforcement, we've seen big changes. And uh, one of the big changes uh, that I've seen personally is um, with, uh, I mentioned that I worked on terrorism cases, uh, with 9-11. All of a sudden, prior to 9-11, the Department of Justice was focusing on crimes that have been cr committed. You know, you, you get mugged, you, you, you know, if, if there's a, a federal crime, a bank gets robbed, um, you know, with the crime is committed. And then investigators investigate the crime, and then they make a referral to the Department of Justice to prosecute uh, criminally. So it is after the fact. And in the fraud instance, when we developed fraud cases, you know, the money was already paid, the money was already lost, it was a pay and chase. And uh, we've, I've done forfeiture cases as well, so sometimes we get the money back. Uh, so we call it that pay and chase model. But with 9-11, and, and I was there when Attorney General Ashcroft was there, and during 9-11, uh, I worked in the Deputy Attorney General's office, and uh, our whole model changed because uh, we needed to protect the American people and um, um, needed to detect where the attacks would be, where the crimes would be, and try and prevent it. And that's a different mindset for uh, uh, people in law enforcement. But that really occurred in 9-11. In and so we were working through that. And you know, I know that uh, uh, 
uh, Attorney General Ashcroft made many speeches about this paradigm shift, and so did um, Deputy Attorney General uh, Larry Ashcroft. And, uh, and that's a challenge. Now, we don't have a 9-11 with the pandemic relief programs, but um, we are changing the model a bit because we want to prevent money from going out. Now, Congress needed to get the money out. A lot of the money went out. Uh, and so, but one of our objectives early on was to try and prevent money going out to criminals or to those, to corrupt individuals or whatever euphemism you want to use, uh, I think. In international surface they, circles, they say corrupt individuals. Um, you know, in law enforcement circles, we're, we're really not that fancy. We just say crooks. Um, but um, so um, uh, challenged, uh, ethically challenged individuals and organizations are taking advantage of th these programs. And normally, it, when the federal government has a program, it does have controls in place. It has anti-fraud mechanisms in place. And even with the anti-fraud mechanisms in pl place, I want to walk, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to lose uh, Mike. Um, even in regular uh, government programs with anti-fraud mechanisms in place, you have, uh, you know, they estimate 10, 15, sometimes even 20% fraud. Uh, I used to do healthcare fraud at one, at one point in my uh, career, and uh, the, one of the uh, healthcare fraud prosecutors that I worked with a lot we always kind of amused ourselves by whatever administration was in place. They'd always say, well, I estimate 15% fraud in Medicare and Medicaid programs. And then, you know, another administration come in, would come in, I estimate about, you know, 20% fraud. And we're thinking, they don't know. Uh, fraud by its very nature is hidden. People don't want other people to know that they're committing fraud. And you know, even if we can catch and detect and prosecute uh, the people committing fraud, we have no guarantee that we've caught everyone because some of them are very slick. So it's so hard to predict what kind of fraud is uh, in regular federal programs. But generally, they estimated about 15%, you know, give or take a few percentage points and what the program is. Okay, and that's a program with anti-fraud mechanisms. So, you know, if you think logically about this, if you take out the anti-fraud mechanisms, you probably would expect the fraud to go which way? I think there would be a higher level of fraud or a lower level. You know, if you, if you say, look, you don't have to certify, if, you know, you don't have to tell the truth on this application, we're going to give you the money anyway, it, you know, maybe nobody will lie. You know, it's possible. I would hope so. Uh, but the percentage of people who lie probably will go up. And so I, my estimates of the fraud are way up from, from other estimates that are given out in the uh, pandemic relief program. I'll give you an example to ponder you know, what, I, what I call the uh, uh, inverse proportionality of fraud to anti-fraud mechanisms. But I'll, I'll give you a, a concrete example so you can think about it. Uh, there was a health care program that was part of the CARES Act provider relief program um, to uh, uh, health care professionals. So um, has anybody heard of that? No, of, of course not. Um, the, the, uh, it, it's to help uh, health care providers during the pandemic. And the program was designed so that they gave the money out first. And then they received applications that the recipients were eligible. Um, so there was no anti-fraud mechanism <laughs> right there. Um, so uh, that's an example of when you take out the anti-fraud mechanisms, there may be more fraud. There may not be. You know, let's hope everybody's honest and, uh, and uh, not corrupt or uh, everybody's ethical. But that's not always the case. Um, when I was first confirmed as Special Inspector General, for pandemic recovery, I got a call from a friend in private practice, uh, worked for a big law firm. He said, I, I just want you to know I turned down a client. He wanted me to create five new shell corporations so that he could have five new applications for pandemic uh, recovery programs. 
And uh, you know, as as we talk more, we'll we'll find out that some of the things that my office is doing is we're, we're scrubbing data from everywhere. And uh, we, you know, we've compared employment records and corporate records, and some of these corporations did not exist prior to the program existing. So uh, so that was going on. I mean, there are a number of different ways in which people can take advantage of the system and game the system. Uh, we're also looking at the lenders that are involved. Some of these programs are complicated, where you have funding from the Department of the Treasury, through the Federal Reserve Board, through the Federal Reserve Banks, to a special uh, purpose vehicle that lends out the money. And sometimes um, individual banks m may take the advantage, and uh, there there is a possibility that they may be not following the rules and uh, uh, making sure that their own private loans are paid back and that uh, uh, they they are made whole because if there's a default on a Main Street lending program, the bank is only responsible for 5%. The Department of the Treasury pays the 95%. And uh, they're also allowed to charge fees and, also, and in interest. So they've already made their 5% back, you know, very quickly. But uh, that, those are just examples, and I don't want to ramble. Uh, so uh, thank you for indulging me, Karina, with that. Of course. Thank you so much for that overview. You mentioned, of course, scrubbing the data from multiple sources. And so as you are thinking about when you were setting up this office, knowing the, to borrow your term, the daunting task ahead of you with this oversight, what were some of the things that you knew your office had to get right in terms of the data infrastructure, in terms of the skill sets maybe at home in your office as you are thinking about combating this, this pay and chase model? Well, uh, we had to get a, a, a lot of things right. Um, we were a temporary office. So we knew we couldn't sit back and wait. So we, um, we went out, we, we uh, sought to get data systems and uh, collect data from different sources. We've entered into memorandum of understanding with various federal agencies and other organizations. But we, need to, we need, knew we needed lots of data and we are looking at lots of data from various sources. And of course, as you all know, because you're in the data, this data uh, session, uh, da data is not the same. And so, you know, obviously standardized data is easier to work with, but we get a lot of data that's just incompatible. And so we have to work through that. We have to put it in a standardized form uh, in order to assess the data, process it, and analyze it. And, um, and so we are doing that. Uh, we are looking at lots of data. Um, it's a challenge to us. And I, I would like to say that, um, Karina, when you did your introduction, you mentioned uh, making certain data public and, and serving a public role. And a public, uh, uh, there is a public service, a service to um, law enforcement and uh, individuals and organizations that fight fraud for the government. Um, you know, we look at those reports. And if, if you can make data public and, uh, and the public can go through and analyze the data and find fraud, find what we call red flags or indicators of fraud, uh, and you write a report, we use that. So it's a public service to be able to get the data standardized and out to the public so that uh, individuals can help the government root out this fraud, waste, and abuse. And there is a federal statute, uh, the False Claims Act. And does any, has anybody heard of that? The False Claims Act, the Lincoln Law sometimes? Yeah, okay, we've got one or two lawyers in the audience. Uh, and um, that is a federal statute enacted after the Civil War because the government was being ripped off with uh, bags of sawdust instead of gunpowder and things of that nature. It allows private citizens to bring suit in federal court on behalf of the federal government. Normally, only the federal government can go into federal court to uh, bring a suit on behalf of the, of the federal government. But this law especially empowers private citizens to go forward and file a lawsuit saying there's fraud in this program. And the government's been defrauded by you know X million dollars. And they get a reward for that. They get a percentage of it. They get their attorney's fees paid. 
And uh, when they prove the fraud, they actually, you know, there is a benefit to the individual. And uh, um, the, uh, it's called the False Claims Act, sometimes called the Lincoln Law because of the, uh, 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 when it was passed. Uh, and that is in existence. There's a whole division in the Department of Justice that handles those cases. And so the, they, they do exist. Other individuals publish reports. I know my office reads a lot of reports. And we follow up on the information that you find, that you've analyzed for us. So it is public service. So thank you. Yes, I, I have to laugh as talking about your MOUs that got st stood up so quickly. I come from the federal statistical system where MOUs may take years to get into place. So I appreciate the speed with which your office worked on this. Um, we worked at lightning speed. And talk about uh, a challenge. I came in, uh, I, my first day was April 6th. I was the only one in the office. And I had uh, prosecutors from various US attorney's offices that wanted to come work for me. I had IT specialists, uh, cyber specialists. And I got a ton of calls from HR people from various uh, federal agencies saying, hey, what's the number of your HR person so I can, uh, we can work out this detail or, or this uh, arrangement to have the person work for your office temporarily? And I had to say, well, um, I'm, I'm the only one in the office. I, I was confirmed you know, like three days ago. And, uh, and it took time to work out all that. And it's challenging starting a federal office from scratch anyway. I mean, think of all the various, I mean, private companies think they have a lot of federal requirements to meet. Well, imagine a federal office. Um, we have even more. Uh, and uh, setting that up is, is daunting, no matter what. But imagine doing it during a pandemic when nobody's in the office. Something as simple as getting an ID card. Um, I have one with me, an ID card to get into the building. It took a long time because we had to call the uh, person that makes the call, call, who was at home, and arrange for that person to come in and operate the machinery to make the card to get my employee in the building to help. Uh, and uh, that's just one example. I mean, there's just countless examples. Um, but we were able to move at lightning speed. Uh, imagine hiring a, a uh, person with law enforcement authority that's a special agent that has carries firearms and can make arrests. There's all sorts of extra hoops. So we were first allowed and permitted and hired a special agent in December of 2020. Wow. My office was stood up in, well, if you count me sitting, sitting at my desk uh, April of uh, 2020, mid-April. And uh, in December, we hired our first special agent. But nevertheless, we were able to put together a case of someone who defrauded the Main Street Lending Program by April of 2021. A person was indicted by the U.S. Attorney. Now, um, I, I, that's super lightning speed because it takes forever to put together a financial fraud case you, you all are in the fin financial world, so you understand all the documents that have to be analyzed uh, in order to put a case together like that. Not to mention, those of you from the law enforcement world will know that uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office has to analyze the case that law enforcement puts together. They often will want to do their own investigation, so there's often a grand jury investigation where the special agent testifies and a grand jury returns an indictment. And uh, during a pandemic, the courts were affected too. So um, grand juries were affected. And nevertheless, we put the case together. We, uh, um, there was grand jury con uh, convened. There was an indictment by April of 2021. And we've had uh, more indictments. We've had individuals plead guilty. Uh, and the Main Street Lending Program also is a very difficult program. Remember, a prosecutor, I, I was a prosecutor, and the idea of standing up before 12 laymen and explaining uh, a complicated set of events and facts is difficult. And remember, just explaining what the program was, let alone the fraud. The program 
you know, goes from Treasury to Federal Reserve to the special purpose vehicle to a bank lending the money. Uh, just to explain the background. <laughs> <laughs> so these are difficult cases. I think we're, we're making a unique contribution by looking at those um, uh, unique uh, programs and many of the high dollar amounts are there. The direct loans are in the millions of dollars um, that we're, we're looking at. And uh, we're doing audits and investigations and uh, all sorts of uh, reviews of those programs with very little resources. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to invite Steve and our other two panelists to join us on stage to have a more uh, wide-ranging conversation about the data infrastructure that goes into allowing this sort of enforcement to work. So David, Lakshmi, Steve, if you'd like to join, and I will hand them up. Oh, we're going we're gonna to do that all at the end. Thank you so much. Let me just get my uh, notes situated here, if you don't mind. All right. Um, my name is, good morning all, thank you for coming and thank you for the Data Foundation for sponsoring uh, this panel up here. My name is uh, Stephen Mazanis. I have been within the financial industry for over 28 years now. I work at Bloomberg. Um, I'm currently responsible for our LEI services. If you don't know what an LEI is, we'll talk about that at some point today. Um, also responsible for regulatory content for the firm and any of our open data standards such as the Financial Instrument Global Identifier. Uh, Corinna alluded to having data, uh, actually uh, Brian and Corinna alluded to having data free and open. So that's part of what I have to do at, at Bloomberg. Um, before I start and give a brief overview, um, let me let the other two panelists, uh, Lakshmi and David, introduce themselves. Good morning. Yes, you can hear me. Um, good morning. I realize this isn't the most pleasant weather in DC today, so thank you for coming in so early, everyone, and joining us. Uh, my name is Lakshmi Kumar. I'm the policy director at Global Financial Integrity. We are a think tank based in uh, Washington, DC, but we have extensive portfolios of work, um, both in Latin America and um, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. We work very closely with governments and civil society organizations. Our work is really looking at the ways through which illicit money moves through the financial and trade system. So we provide research, we do advocacy, we draft laws, we train governments, we design tools to help collect money and increase revenue from governments as well. So we do everything from start to finish. We're a one-stop shop, essentially. Um, so I'm very happy here to sort of talk about the way we do work and how, how, how you know, data plays such a critical part in, in moving the agenda forward for us. So thank you. Hello. Is it on? Well, thank you very much for having me. My name is David Ciccone. I'm a professor of political science at GW, which is down the street. My day job works on uh, corruption in Russia using big data techniques, but a couple years ago I helped co-found the Anti-Corruption Data Collective, which is a, a group of data, data scientists, policy advocates, academics, and journalists that combine both public and private data sets to do investigations on corruption, money laundering, and economic injustice kind of worldwide. So Brian, we were the first people to combine data on companies that didn't exist before the COVID program. And we came out with that story about a, three or four days after the PPP program was announced. So we've done COVID fraud stories. We've done oligarchic money in the United States stories. We've done studies on uh, private equity and the way that that industry has taken over <laughs> certain sectors and, and economies around the world. And I think I'll be talking today about work on money laundering and real estate. We have some ongoing projects in the United States, in the UK, in France. We kind of do a lot of different things and some academic articles, some journalistic investigations. But the whole goal is to kind of change legislation and change policy to improve transparency and, and accountability in, in countries around the world, not just the United States. So thank you very much for having me and I look forward to talking about some of our work. 
Thank you, David, for that report. And that's an example of how the public can really help us uh, go after the fraud, waste, and abuse. So before I uh, fire away questions, I want to um, read something to you that I got off the UN site. Um, and this is quite staggering. The annual cost of international corruption, corruption um, amounts to a staggering 3.6 trillion dollars annually, both in the public and private sector. Um, that, you know, th that could be in the form of bribes, stolen money. Um, corruption obviously takes many forms, uh, bribery, embezzlement, money laundering, tax evasion, etc. cetera. Um, but it often, it often leads to weaker institutions, less prosperity, denial of basic services. Fighting corruption is a global concern. Uh, concern that hurts people dispro disproportionately, especially the poorer nations are hurt more than, than the richer nations. Um, it contributes to instability in the world, poverty, and it's a dominant factor in driving countries towards state failure. Um, we're gonna talk today about what civil society and governments across the globe, what they're faced with, with identifying the entities, identifying entities they're dealing with from onboarding an entity, um, to understanding its beneficial, beneficial ownership and how this infrastructure, this hierarchy, could wreak havoc on understanding fraud and cor uh, corruption abroad. So let me start, Lakshmi, with you. Um, can you give us some broad strokes on why beneficial ownership structures are so difficult uh, to navigate? What are some of the roadblocks? Oh, wow, that's, that's a whole universe, isn't there, when we talk about beneficial ownership. Um, you know, I, I, I assume, I imagine everyone in the room is familiar with beneficial ownership, but in a nutshell, it is this, the, the ability to identify an individual and human being behind a corporate structure. Now, what makes this challenging is that you can, we, in the last couple of years, we've seen over 100 countries commit to beneficial ownership registries. And that in itself is such a fantastic move forward. But the reality of beneficial ownership is that when it is set up in a country, you're not just dealing with a, for example, let's take the US, you're not dealing with a company just set up in the US. You're dealing with a company that's set up in the US that is owned by maybe another Panamanian company that is maybe in turn owned by another trust in BVI. So what do you see very often with beneficial ownership is the company that starts in the US. Its ownership can extend across 10 countries horizontally, but then the ownership across those 10 entities, you can have someone own 2% of the first company, 10% of the second company, 50% of the third company. So you're able to hide information across geographies, but you're also able to hide information vertically in terms of how you own it through shareholding or interest. And that is what makes it so difficult because it's not just enough when the US creates it. You also have to make sure that every other country on that list is willing to share share information or you have to have make sure that your reg registry domestically is strong enough to collect that information from both the horizontal way it's spread, but also that vertical spread. And the reality is there is a lot of bad information out there in beneficial ownership registries. Because you, are, you have someone submit this information, then it's upon the government with sometimes very limited resources, having to verify the structure, you're having to verify it to make sure it exists across those countries and exists across this both horizontal and vertical path. And not every government has that capacity, not every government has the capability. I mean, we are, and, and sort of, it's, it's gonna take a while till we sort of fix all of that. And the last third piece of the problem is when you talk about these horizontal and vertical structures, you're not talking about the same type of legal entity. You're talking about a company, a partnership, a trust, a foundation, and then you have things in different countries. For example, India has something called a Hindu undivided family. That is a unique legal structure that is unique to India. It exists in no other part of the world. And you will see similar things in different parts of the world. Like you see an Anstalt and Liechtenstein, a foundation that's called something else. You have a pa Panamanian private interest foundation, which is a company that's merged with a trust. 
So all of those things, you know, add to the complexity and challenge of it. And if you're sitting, let's say, in Kenya and you're looking at this, you've never heard of sometimes these structures. But if you're the regulator, you're like, OK, I've got to figure out how this thing works because I have to make sure that the information that's submitted is cor um, correct. But this is, I don't want to be pessimistic because I'm not a pessimistic person about this. But I think knowing these challenges helps us tell governments how they should design data, how they should create forms so they can adequately collect information that allows them to do better analysis. Yeah, and, and to add to that, definitionally, when certain companies on, on certain forms and you have to report your, your subsidiary structure or your hierarchy structure, they only look at the subsidiaries, which by definition is over 51% ownership. One definition, another definition is your reporting parent. So you're missing all of these other firms that may have some association with this firm because it's a 2% it's a ownership or it's a 3% ownership, or you're just a sponsor of this special purpose entity in some small island somewhere. So definitionally is where we need to start, is defining, you know, not only to report on subsidiaries, but affiliations and those overall relationships. Um, and then secondarily, you're talking about these legal forms. And, you know, across the globe, there's thousands of them. ISO, the International Standards Organization, actually has a pretty... Uh, uh, inclusive list of legal forms globally associated per jurisdictions defining what a uh, limited partnership is, a corporation is, uh, a trust is, etc. So at least from a data perspective, we're, we're getting a little smarter creating these enumerated values that governments uh, and the private sector for that matter could use in terms of onboarding or understanding these entities. I just have one quick point which I forgot to mention, which is um, at the same time, you have a lot of data providers that provide you company information. And one of the big, <laughs> notoriously problematic things I often have to deal with is databases that will charge you $100,000 will say, oh, this is beneficial ownership information. It is not beneficial ownership information. And this is especially rampant because I do a lot of work in trade with shipping companies the only available biggest data sets which are extremely expensive for banks, private sector, civil society, and sometimes for many governments, list shipping company data as beneficial ownership information. Let me tell you and underline this, it is not beneficial ownership information. So that's something also we have to sort of talk through and make sure that that gets more accurate. Yeah, I definitely agree as a data provider, so I hear where you're coming from. Um, let's, uh, let's move on here for a little bit. So David, you talked about the Anti-Corruption Data Collective. So what data is there, and why is it so important to get that data to non-government actors? Well, I'll be honest, there's not a lot of data out there. Let's be serious. There, we have dozens of research questions that we can't do because we can't find the necessary inputs, we can't get the governments to share the data, we can't afford the private subscriptions that keep it behind paywalls. I mean, it's just a pretty bleak landscape. We're making do with crumbs, and I think kind of sometimes baking some pretty delicious bread out of them, but a lot of times it's a, it's a struggle. So I don't want to kind of make this seem better than it is. There's a lot of work to be done to facilitate cooperation, and especially from the government's just openness. The governments are sitting on treasure troves of data that are of immense value to different types of investigators and academics to evaluate the effectiveness of policies. And there is still a reticence, I think, on many, many different government agencies that the public has a role to play. So in this country, for example, we have the Corporate Transparency Act, a beneficial ownership registry that should come online in the next couple of years, but that's going to be only available to law enforcement agencies. And I know they're going to do a fantastic job with that data, but if you expanded the number of actors that had access to it, you would direct, dramatically improve the, the kind of value and the, the importance of that data. So what we do at ACDC is we try to look for publicly available data sets. Sometimes it's administrative data from governments. Sometimes it's these private sector um, third party aggregators. Sometimes it's on the gray market, right? We, we, we have an ethical compass. We have many investigative journalists kind of guiding our work and participating in it. But we know that there's data out there that sometimes is on the dark net. And we want to exploit that if it's going to expose um, bad actors doing bad things. 
Um, we combine it. I, I can't say that our technology is that sophisticated. We have access to all the fancy machine learning and AI tools, but a lot of times you don't need that to do really high quality investigations. What you really need is just data and visibility into certain types of corporate structures, and you're connecting the dots with some standardization and some cleaning and some merging and parsing, but it's not actually that high tech, and you, you don't need to over-invest in really kind of fancy systems. It really, the underlying data is the most important, and you can make the most progress doing that. I'm happy to talk about you know, specific investigations, but you know, a lot of times where the data is hiding in plain sight, we're scraping it, putting together, analyzing it in creative ways, um, and going from there. It's hard for us to get data from other federal agencies as well. And uh, we talked about MOUs, a memoranda of understanding, um, which we have for, with many of the uh, agencies that collect data. Nevertheless, it's still hard to get that, get permission to get the data, to get the data, to get it in a form we can use. And then they put all sorts of restrictions on how we can use the data and who we can share it with. And uh, it's just a difficult uh, data sharing, information sharing is uh, extremely difficult. Yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely agree. But David, to your point earlier about you know, um, this information being hard. I think, look, to me, it starts with the entity itself. A lot of systems re rely on a name and a name alone. So when you're saying, okay, here's my, my counterparty, we'll say Bloomberg. Well, Bloomberg LP, Bloomberg Inc., Bloomberg Finance LP, you don't know. So if you start piecing additional pieces of, or adding additional pieces of metadata, such as the legal form, the registration address, the domicile address, then you start getting somewhere because you need this additional data outside of just name or these name disambiguation services that parse or look at this and say, this is the definite, uh, definite entity. You don't know that. Um, and a great example of that is, if you recall, 2008, um, during the last financial crisis, Lehman Brothers, when they went under, they went bankrupt. And one of the things that regulators and these bankruptcy lawyers had to do was unwind swap transaction. Do you know to this day they are still unwinding some of those transactions because they were based on name and name alone? Um, it doesn't work like that. So it's all these different data sets that the panelists are talking about that you need to uniquely identify that entity. And on top of that, the relationships across those entities. Um, David, I'm going to stick with you. Um, you and some Fellow uh, other researchers published a report on the impact of beneficial ownership uh, transparency on uh, purchases of U.S. property. Uh, can you tell us more about that? And really, what is the state of beneficial ownership within real estate? Sure. So it probably is going to come to no surprise, no surprise to anyone in this room. The United States has been a really attractive destination for money laundering in real estate for, for decades now. And about five years ago, the government responded to a couple high profile investigations to pass a pretty exciting pilot program where in about 30 counties across the country, Manhattan, Los Angeles, um, places where there's Miami, places where there's historically been a lot of anecdotal evidence of corrupt and kleptocratic actors stashing money in real estate. They said, well, if you buy an apartment or a house using a corporate entity and using all cash, so no relationship, no loan from a bank, you have to report your beneficial owners to an agency in the um, US Department of Treasury, which will compile that information. You report it through an intermediary called the title insurer, um, who kind of transmits that information to the government. But it's, it's very similar to a beneficial ownership registry, but it's not public. It's available to law enforcement, and there is some kind of evidence that that information was shared among the FBI and other types of, kind of police agencies to go after these people. But it's an exciting, it was an exciting development, still is an exciting development in the United States because it's increasing transparency in this sector that we know has you know, billions of dollars. Lakshmi has a recent report trying to put a number on that, but it's in the tens of billions of dollars of what, just what we know in terms of corrupt money in US real estate. So as academics and analysts, we said, okay, what happened after this pilot program was introduced in these small number of counties across the country? How did real estate markets change or not change when transparency was introduced for this subset of corporate purchases? And it's a kind of depressing finding, and you can read the academic report or the blog post that summarizes it, but it didn't have any effect. It did not deter 
behavior, did not change behavior by corporate entities in the way that they were moving money into luxury real estate across the United States. So that's a, you kind of have to take a step back and be like, okay, our most kind of innovative pilot program seemed not to, to really change people's behavior. But what, why? What went wrong? What can we do to improve the policy? And we don't know for sure. We're still trying to talk to, to Treasury and get a better sense of what's going on with this program. But we think that it comes down to, to verification. There wasn't somebody in the government that was checking this data that was tasked with taking in this reports and cross-validating it, checking it against other databases. There wasn't really enforcement. We have no, no instances where somebody's property was taken away based on the report that they submitted to this beneficial ownership type registry. So there weren't any news stories where people thought, oh my gosh, if I don't submit true information, they're gonna come after me and take my, my, my um, apartment or, pal or you know, mansion away from me. And in general, there weren't the resources and capacity in Treasury to kind of prioritize overall these verification and, and, and validation and mechanisms. So the data wasn't public. There's still a lot we don't know. We, we think, and we have some kind of emerging evidence that in other countries where the data is public, you can see greater progress being made more quickly because you know the, the bad actors understand that it's not just law enforcement that may come after them. It's journalists and civil society activists and so forth. But we think that those three tenets are, are key to any real beneficial, effective beneficial ownership program. And so I have you know, measured hopes for the US going forward with the beneficial ownership program because I just know how important that public component, I know how difficult verification is. And right now we're still working out all the kinks, I think, in the government about what that's gonna look like. I, it's too early to tell whether or not it's gonna work out. But um, the quicker we get these lessons learned from other programs out there, I think the, the more effective the ultimate policy regulation will be. But it's a kind of a race against time because a lot of times once these structures are put into place, it's hard to change them later. Um, so it's, we really want to get as many policy evaluations into the public sphere and, and inform the discussion before the, the rules are finalized and companies start changing their due diligence and, and compliance with them. So, so in this case, it's more of a policy issue than a data issue. Well, the, there's a data issue in that the data was never made public, and therefore we have significant limitations in order to evaluate the policy. You know, the data we use, for people that are curious, is uh, there's, I don't know if you're familiar with Zillow. You've probably seen some commercials on television we've been here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a tech firm that collects data on real estate across the country. If you're late at night trying to think about how to upgrade your apartment, you'll probably go to Zillow to get a sense of what's on the market or not. They had a great program for about five or six years where they shared their entire data set of 300 million properties with academics and civil society for free. You could get the data within a month and look at the entire US real estate sector. We use that to evaluate the policy because there is no centralized real estate land registry or cadaster in the United States. We had to use a private actor. The cost of that data is between 100 and 200 thousand dollars if you're buying it, but they allowed you know, researchers to access it for the public interest um, and that's what we exploited to do the research. So I agree with you, it's both data and policy. Um, you have to get creative when there's so many different roadblocks around the way. Thank you. Um, let's talk about alternative um, investments right now. Um, cryptocurrency transactions, you see it in the news. A lot of these uh, firms are going bankrupt um, and lost investments in there. Um, Brian, this goes to you. Um, I, these transactions could obviously make your life a bit harder um, because of the anonymity, uh, the anonymousness that comes with this type of activity. Um, is finding criminals here a lost cause? You know, that's easy for you to say, Steve. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, cryptocurrency, I've written an article on cryptocurrency, and cryptocurrency, it, there's a paradox. It makes it easier and harder at the same time. So you get more information if you're a regulator or a fraud fighter. Uh, you get more information because you can trace the transactions in cryptocurrency. And, th and so that makes it easier. And, and you get more information. But the entities, individuals behind the transactions are hidden. And that makes it hard. So uh, you get more and you get less. So it's more or less information. Um, Okay, nobody laughed. <laughs> um, but um, it doesn't make it impossible. We are still going uh, after those who change uh, federal money into cryptocurrency. 
and we have information where we have uh, individuals, we, we get information from different sources, we have in, in information that individuals have bought certain amounts of cryptocurrency. And it's almost, not quite, but almost dollar for dollar the amount of money they got from a pandemic relief program a week or two earlier. So, you know, I do think it's going on. Once they hide it in cryptocurrency, we can trace it, but we, uh, to some extent, but once it goes into um, these anonymous, it's hard to say, anonymous uh, individuals, uh, then we lose our ability to see and they can be violating all sorts of conditions of the money. They could be sending it overseas. Many times they do. Uh, they can you know, be giving out it out in executive compensation, various other things that are totally unrelated to pandemic or relief fraud. Thank you. So there's debate out in the street about cryptocurrency. Is it a financial instrument or is it a commodity? So that would dictate what regulatory body, at least in the states, should have oversight over that. So what are your thoughts? Should it be the SEC or the CFTC? Uh, I'm not sure you really, I really want to wade into that one, Steve. Th thanks so much for the question. <laughs> um, I'm not a policymaker. I I'm a law enforcement uh, person. We just enforce the law, we don't make it. And I'll leave that important question to others, but maybe uh, uh, other panelists will have ideas on this. They don't want to jump in either. Tough question. I have no opinion myself, uh, for the record here. Um, Lakshmi, let's uh, uh, jump over to you. Um, your organization uses evidence-based research to recommend specific policy and regulatory ask. Um, can you talk about what goes into that research, and how can your research help inspectors and others uh, combat the corruption that's going on? Um, I'll, I'll, uh, so what I will say is, you know, our research tends to be global, and I think the first thing very often with research is you have to understand who your audience is and what is the language that your audience understands. And, and, and I think that's, no matter where you are, that is a really big part of it and often gets lost, I've seen, globally. So for example, a good example is when we talk about a lot of research in the U.S., you frame it through the national security paradigm, especially when it has got anything to do with international corruption, international money laundering, because that is a narrative arc that makes sense. Now, similarly, because we do an equal amount of work in building evidence and building research in Latin America and in certain parts of um, East Africa and West Africa, the one thing that you quickly realize is when you start talking about corruption, Corruption can be a dangerous word to say in many countries because you have very narrow, narrow civil society space. Um, you know, corruption means you're directly challenging the government in question. So you have to find alternate phrasing. So what we often do is even if we see money going out through corruption, we often frame it as, look at this, you are losing money you desperately need for revenue collection. You're losing money you need for social services, for health services. And that's often how we frame research. And a lot of it is about the context in which you work in. Um, and especially I see a lot of our African colleagues in this room, I think that's something you will understand. You know, Using the narrative tax and the tax agenda, a lot of work on anti-corruption has moved forward, especially in the extractive sector where there's close to a trillion dollars lost every year across the continent. That's how you move the agenda. And so I, will, I cannot emphasize enough how important framing your evidence-based research for your audience is. Um, I think the second thing is a lot of the times we forget um, how important sort of both open source data is. There's plenty of it out there. We don't think about it. And also you can think about how to use data innovatively. So you know the one thing you can do is, yes, you can crunch data and pull together numbers. A lot of the times, as David said, we don't have data. So what we then do is we, we try and do surveys of experts, and then we put that together as a, a data source. Or alternatively, we look at policy measures. Very often, we talk about blockchain as the solution to all of life's problems, and it really isn't. Um, but you try and putting in blockchain in countries where the labor market is 70% informal. And so we try and pull from other sources of both development, labor force data, employment data, to think about corruption. 
And the last thing I will say is, um, you know, I'm a lawyer by training, so <laughs> I would say I often say I'm a lawyer that dabbles in data. I'm not an economist. There is, even if it's imperfect, what you're trying to do is move the advocacy case forward or move the argument forward. And so, like as David mentioned, we GFI also put out a report on real estate and the issues of money laundering. And we, we did not have data. So what we did is we looked at five years of all real estate money laundering cases in the US and used it, broke it down to identify the typologies of money laundering, the locations where they were, the money was being laundered in the US, where the money was coming from outside the US, um, what types of company structures, real estate agents, whether there were politicians involved, and, it, and, and for the first time we realized how much commercial real estate was being used in, in, uh, in the US. And I will say, you know, it's not perfect, it was not, it's not robust, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. But what it did get is it got the White House to say, to put down a number and say we recognize this as a problem, we now want to make this a priority and cite the report. And so I think that's something that a lot of people sitting here should be aware of and think about. Like, even if you don't have data, even if you don't data, what are the other ways to sort of create a narrative, create, because a lot of what we are doing with corruption and in this space is about what mobilizes action is powerful stories. And so no matter what you're presenting, even if it's robust data, you have to turn and convert that into a powerful story and narrative. And I would say, you know, that's, that's, some of it is that is how we start to finish. And the last thing I will say is, and I find this to be an interesting quirk, data can be hidden in the oddest places. Governments sometimes have data, but they will hide it in a place where they don't want you to find it. So having someone local who can know the system, know the government, find the data is a really good thing. And I, I mean, if I don't want to sort of take up too much time, but if there is later time in the panel, I can, I can give you a couple of interesting examples where I found data where data should not be. Um, and then you realize, oh, this is actually brilliant, but it should be in this other website, which is the more appropriate website for this data. So thank you. Actually, that's interesting. So this is for both uh, yourself, Lakshmi, and David. Um, you talk about finding data in unusual places. Um, could you tell us how you find data in plain sight that we just overlook? This is for, for both of you. Sure. I, you know, if I had a secret sauce, I, I, I still probably wouldn't be able to divulge it. But I, I don't have like a set of tools about how to find it. I think, I think Lakshmi is right that you. You need to be creative in the way that you think where the data might be, and it's oftentimes in counterintuitive or paradoxical places. Um, other times it's about thinking that the, the data set that you need, uh, in, in, in academia, you, I always give my graduate students this question as they begin their projects, which is like, if God, a non-denominational God, was your research assistant, what data would you want in order to answer the question that you're trying to answer? So if you think about your ideal data set, that data can come from maybe 10 or 20 or 30 different places. You don't have to look for one single spot in order to bring it all together. And it's about that creativity and looking for multiple sources. Um, but I'll give you an example. So we had, a, we had an investigation about oligarchic money in the United States post-invasion in, in Russia, or about Russians that um, are putting money in many different ways. So there are people that are looking at the yachts. There are people that are looking at the the mansions, and there are definitely people looking at the financial instruments. But we've been aware for many years that there's also a lot of financial or uh, charitable donations that oligarchs have been making in the U.S. to the Met and to MoMA and to the Lincoln Center, and they're all kind of cataloged in in PDFs on NGO websites across the entire internet. And because there's a whole industry of people trying to raise money for NGOs, I'm sure you're very familiar with this industry, as all of us need to do fundraising, there are services that collect data on high, wealth, high net worth individuals is around the world and the donations that they make to charitable foundations. But we realized that there were oligarchs sitting in this database for the last 20 years because their names were in the PDFs of these foundational annual reports and the amount of money that they gave with their families. So what we could do is compile all these PDFs from around the internet and use some of the existing databases and supplement them to get a much better picture of all of the Russian money that went into the nonprofit sector 
over the last 20 years and make an argument that like we need to better due diligence and transparency because money and influence can transmit in, in different ways and there, there's ways of reputation laundering in addition to money laundering. So it's about thinking about your question and who else might be collecting that data for a completely different purpose that you can use for your investigative angle um, and, and kind, of, kind of repurpose it in, in that way. And I think that's where a lot of our kind of most successful endeavors have been coming from kind of like, oh, I didn't know you could do that with that data set. I didn't know you could answer that question. I thought it was something for something completely different. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say I used the time that David was talking to quickly jot down a couple of examples there. <laughs> Um, so I will say like one of the things you see is like in this space, and this is very true because it's so, th there are national priorities, it's influenced, it's a big foreign policy tool at the end of the day, a lot of the policies we are talking about. So often one of the things I see with the research is this echo chamber effect in that if you're sitting in the US, you are just talking arguably to experts, but just US experts, even though it's a cross-border issue. So to give you an example, we had to do um, research on drug trafficking for the US Congress. And there was one statistic from the US, very well researched, which said that bulk cash smuggling is increasing, which means the US is putting more resources towards that because it's the US-Mexico border. The Mexican government also released a government document which said bulk cash smuggling is decreasing. So it's two governments talking about the same issue with different numbers. And so if, you, if your job is to say to do policy, it may seem simple and shocking, but it is me telling that we have sort of, you, if you want to move policy forward, you actually have to talk to the other side. You have to say, okay, this is something, bulk cash smuggling is something that has to work at a cross-border level. So either you have a conversation about it, but you are, you are the, the consequence of two different data, especially with something so critical, is you have two different approaches on an issue that requires critical cooperation. Um, now the UAE is an often is a huge problem because it is a black hole of information. And I sometimes very firmly believe the absence of data in itself is a strong data narrative tool. And for instance, no one knew how many free zones there were in the UAE because you didn't know what was going on. And as simple as it seems, I spent my time trying to just number it out. And in the process of numbering it out, you realized how many sort of problems were there. And then when the Financial Action Task Force came out with its report, everyone turned around and said, okay, this is how many free zones the, the, the evaluation never said, oh, this is the total number of free trade zones, because they were very careful in their words. And so the fact that we had just tried to do something simple, like counted, showed the problem. And at the same time, you know, when the UAE government had submitted data on how many suspicious activity reports they had produced, when I looked at the numbers, some of them were for a for sort of the free zones, they had $35 billion flowing through it, but they had only submitted 100 suspicious activity reports in a year. And when you then compare it with countries that have similar sized economies, you can see why that number is small. So even, and even when someone is trying to sort of obfuscate information and try to miscategorize it, the fact that someone is trying to miscategorize it is a red flag and that's a risk. And so I think that's something. Um, the last thing I sort of wanted to mention was like, I did work in Sudan where there's a lot of gold and oil. And one thing when we try to help a government, especially with issues of corruption and trade-based money laundering is, if your economy, 70% of your exports or your GDP comes from one sector, the one thing we did was like, okay, you have no data, but what you can do is look at what percentage of your bank's service loans to this sector. And we, when we were looking at banking numbers, just public information, I found out that 2% of the loans they give out were to the mining and oil and gas sector, which means they have no idea where the rest of the money is coming in to the biggest exports in their country. And so just sometimes thinking about like asking questions like, okay, we have no data here, but someone has to finance extractive, someone has to finance mining, someone has to finance oil. So what are other pieces of information I can get? Um, the last thing I'll give as an example is, is in Uganda again. We were trying to track gold. There was, we could not find how much gold was produced in the mining website, in the extract, um, the, uh, the, the trade website, the central bank website. 
For some reason, it was miraculously hidden in the Bureau for Standards of Weights and Measures, which essentially gives certification for food and food products. But that's where we found it. And so that, that's just a, a weird example of, you know, sometimes the, the stories I've had to, the, you know, the, the crazy ways I've had to try and find information. Thank you. So it's interesting. So you, you get two different reports that are saying two different things. And this is for the entire panel. Um, how do you verify the data quality and reliability of the data you're looking at? This, for, all three of you. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very difficult task. And we've had limited success. But when we do, it's because we cross-reference data from two government sources. So a couple years ago, the Luxembourg authorities released a beneficial ownership data set. Uh, that included information on private investment funds, one of the most opaque corporate vehicles around the world, where basically no country in the world requires these, these investment funds um, submit or release information on the ultimate beneficial owners. Well, in Luxembourg, which is actually a good destination for these funds, they did. We wanted to validate this register and figure out whether or not it was telling the truth. Well, the US also collects some information on the same funds and the SEC releases reports on the number of beneficial owners for the funds. So what we did is we took the Luxembourg data and we put it up against the US data and we realized that somebody was lying, right? Somebody was, was, was committing perjury to one of the two governments because in about 30% of the cases, the data just didn't match up. And that's enough for us to know that like, there's, there's something going wrong here um, and we can push further. But, Having that second data set is a, is a luxury and kind of a rarity that you would be able to, to cross-reference it or, or validate it against something that you're more confident in. Um, usually you're just working with one and you're trying to take maybe a random sample of it, follow up, make some phone calls, see what you can do to kind of do some qualitative evidence gathering around it to increase your confidence in the overall data set. But doing that at scale with these massive data sets, it, it, you almost have to trust it and put the caveats in and know that maybe your research is gonna change down the line as more data comes online. It's just kind of the reality of, of doing work in this sector is that you are you're, you're just wanna move forward with what you have, but understand that you know things can change in the future because hopefully more data will come online that you can validate it. But it's, when you're barely, when you're trying barely to get question on, uh, data on questions you're interested in, having two data sets or three data sets is kind of like almost uh, an impossibility in many cases. No, thank you. Um, I mean, I agree with everything da David says. It's sort of the, the big challenge around it. And, and sometimes, you know, like I've seen governments switch data. As I mentioned, talking about the Sudan example, um, we were looking at sort of their sector and we realized that the government had published data. A lot of the data sometimes when you do get it is self-reported. Um, and so, you know, self-reported data has its own dangers. So the government had said, oh, 70% of the market of our exports is from this one product. And when I looked at that data five years later, that number had changed to 2.5% for that same year. And so you had like four different reports, all used different numbers, and they had all referenced this 2014 period. And so I was con confused because a lot of the organizations were that were reporting were reliable. So you know, the, the thing that you do to check is you look at yourself, but you also look to see, okay, is this data accurate? Has someone else reported on this before? It's like basic research. And when I realized there were multiple numbers, I was able to find a presentation that two different government employees from the Sudanese government had made to the UN stuck away in some online version. And that told me that the numbers had changed there as well. So I, between sort of all the research that had come out this end, the government research, the government contradicting itself through a PowerPoint presentation that I think they had very conveniently forgotten about, um, you know, I was able to build a narrative. Other times, you know, what you're looking to, to make sure when you verify or you try your best is, is you're making to, you should, I think with especially self-reported data, you don't know. So you don't want to rely on one instance, you want to rely on trends. So if you see patterns repeating themselves, that in a way lends itself to accuracy. And I, I will say a lot of what I'm talking about exists in the realm of, of trade data. Other times, and I will say, because I'm with civil society, I am very shameless about asking 
private databases that give me research to say, why do you not have this information and make their data research team do the research for me? I do that a lot um, to see if they can give me the answers. And sometimes that's really helpful because you put them in an embarrassing position saying, you say you have the best. I'm civil society. I'm paying a ton of money that I don't want to be paying. You give me the answer. And that can be, so you know, the answer is don't be afraid to ask the question even if you feel like you look dumb at the end of it. I, I have very little embarrassment. So that is a very helpful uh, asset in this case. Thank you. We, we scrub data all the time. And we get inaccurate data, we get bad data. And uh, we always scrub it, we always uh, compare it to other data. We go out and interview witnesses, we uh, get other documents uh, and compare it all the time. We have to be accurate, um, especially in the realm of, of criminal prosecution. And so that is a real problem. Many times two different agencies are asking slightly different questions or not the same sort of uh, comprehensive question or they interpret a fact differently and they end up with different data. And that's a problem. It's also a problem when you translate data from one database to another. Uh, so yes, that is a, a problem. Um, there is a lot of data out there, and unfortunately, some of these inaccuracies can sneak up on you. Uh, there was a, a rock song uh, many years ago by a rock band called uh, Queen. It said, too much love can kill you. Well, maybe sometimes too much data can kill you too. Thank you. Um, we're getting towards the end here because we want to leave some time for questions for the audience. Um, I, I do want to talk about real quick, though, some of the things out there that are helping um, the private sector and policymakers, for that matter, to uniquely identify a particular entity. You're all familiar with the legal entity identifier. Uh, it was born out of the 2000, I mentioned earlier, 2008 financial crisis. Um, out of that, the Dodd-Frank Act came about, which created the Office of Financial Research, which their biggest thing at that particular time was creating, creating the legal entity identifier. It's accepted globally in over 250 uh, rules and or regulations, some required, some recommended. Um, to use the LEI, it it's a 20 character identifier, uniquely identifies a particular entity. There are 39 issuers globally of the LEI. I think the LEI helps with that because part of the data set collected with the LEI is parent information, ultimate parent information, not necessarily beneficial ownership, so that's, but at least it, it, it starts to give you a structure to where these entities fit within this particular tree. Um, the LEI does not uncover if the firm is involved in unscrupulous activities, but at least it gives you the basis to start, which is uniquely identify that particular entity. Um, there's a, a, a rather intensive accreditation process to become an issuer of the LEI. So you have to um, uh, show your credentials that you have the capability to collect this type of data, to analyze this type of data, and to deliver this type of data. Um, it's becoming more and more prevalent. That's one of the things out there right now. But it's, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. It doesn't necessarily identify if the firm's involved with illicit activities. What other technologies and or things, we'll call it, out there that are coming about that'll help um, with identifying beneficial ownership and applying it towards um, your own research, towards uncovering fraudulent activities or, or corrupt activities. Um, any, any three of you want to jump in? You know, the best case, so the best case is you want both sort of you want, when you talk about beneficial ownership information, you want useful and valuable and verified information. You know, beneficial ownership in, sometimes, you know, sometimes bad information is still good, like with company's house when, you know, the person decided to say, I'm Alibaba and the 40 thieves. You know, that's, 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 that tells you that person is probably a, a criminal actor, but you don't get information. And so with beneficial ownership information, our best bet is, um, the registries and hopefully the registries that are public. You know, even if we don't get it, at least the fact that governments and the private sector gets it is a big move forward. Um, the other things I will say is that, you know, the fact that we are now moving towards not just 
you know, every time I think with policy, you have to hit a target before you can move to the next. And I think all of a sudden, there's an increased appetite, both at the international and national levels, to think about not just corruption or illicit activity in the financial side, but also in the trade side. And so suddenly, we've seen requests for trying to collect beneficial ownership information also on the trade side of it. And so I think that the emergence of interest there means you have another source, another set um, of interest. The last thing I will say is that, you know, the various leaks that we've had, like all of that is, that's, is a treasure trove of information out there just in terms of um, how beneficial ownership is recorded. And I think the more people report, record, analyze, and criticize what's going on, we will have better quality of information. And I think the idea is not to sort of rest easy and think that you know the work is done. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I think the, the most exciting thing that's coming online is, uh, I agree with everything that Lakshmi said, but I think I would add one thing, um, would be a global database of politically exposed persons, a PEP database. I, traditionally, this has been in the hands of very expensive private party aggregators. Um, and I think I've heard rumors, you know, there's some movement where there's government financing to bring together civil society activists from many different countries to collate their data into one PEP database with names and birth dates and types of affiliations where you can compare that to a beneficial ownership registry and very quickly get down into who is politically exposed and who might, who should not have the wealth to afford the type of assets that they own around the world. So I think that's a, a really exciting development, but it's unclear when that's gonna come online and how expensive and accessible it would be. And then like way down the line, there are talks of like a global asset registry, which would be, you know, people would not only share their political exposed persons, but their real estate, their, their other types of financial assets, other types of material assets, such as arts and antiquities. So anything that you can own would be in a global asset registry. Now we're decades away from it, but the fact that they're already starting to have having conversations around it is very promising because that would just be a gold mine for tracking down illicit wealth and illicit financial flows. Uh, but you know, I am optimistic, but it's unclear when and how we're going to get access to those two data sources. We're speaking at a, a conference uh, involving data, and I think a lot of people would love to have all sorts of data about every individual in the world. Um, that may be a scary thought, though, because it can be misused. It can be used for nefarious purposes. Obviously, it would make tracking down fraud, waste, and abuse much easier. But there is a tension there. And I'd also warn that any software program that we uh, develop to find information, find beneficial ownership, or find uh, uh, bad actors, corrupt individuals acting as proxies for uh, ineligible uh, recipients, um, it can, criminals, uh, um, corrupt individuals can game the system. They, they look for ways to bypass whatever software you develop. It's an ongoing battle. Thank you, panelists. Um, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I just, you know, I, I found this very interesting because the panelists was a mix of private sector, academia, law enforcement, and policy. So I think you got insights from all different areas um, with different sectors. So um, thank you panelists for sharing your insights, sharing your thoughts. Um, if there are any questions, there is a microphone right there if you'd like to come up and ask questions to any one of the panelists at this time. Good morning. Morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, kind thoughts and presentations. My name is Julian Russo. I represent the National Anti-Corruption Center from Moldova. We've been assessing the due diligence that has to be taken when assessing the various jurisdictions and the transactions, and finally getting up to the to the core of the effective beneficiary. My question is: Is, is there maybe a time to consider? Um, an international tool that will force the jurisdictions that provide limited information or no information at all um, to offer it 
at the end of the day. We have issues uh, that are way back uh, in the end of, of the 80s, the last century, by means of which the International Monetary Fund has highlighted that the offshore jurisdictions may be a problem in terms of at least tax evasion. Well, it's not tax evasion only, it's much more than that. It's corruption, organized crime, uh, drugs, you name it. So what are your thoughts on a tool that will force jurisdictions around the world and using the leverage of the larger countries such as the US uh, to set a system that would exchange this information in a proper way with safeguards that data is false and ultimately help the law enforcement authorities such as the one that I represent and I'm sure that there are many others here in this room to effectively investigate these cases. Ourselves, we've gone into the same problems. It's, it, it's like a deja vu when we are discussing about the, the challenges that you face. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. And that's, um, that's a great question. But it's also a question I deal with all the time about how do you get governments to do something they don't want to do and you don't come across as the bad guy. Um, and and that's, that's a challenging realm to work in. So a couple of things I will say, like for example, like the US has just appointed a new global anti-corruption coordinator at the State Department level, Richard Nephew. And one of the things I think on our end that we've been trying to urge as we see beneficial registers come up, the one thing that sort of come up over and over again is how when you talk about corruption, organized crime, you, you talk about any activity really, a lot of that money comes into the US, and the US is the most requested financial intelligence unit in the world for information. And so there is a real material benefit often to trying to figure out and set up and have dialogues on conversations on, okay, what should be best practices? How should we actually exchange information? Because I think a lot of countries are really confused because a lot of this moves through the MLAT process you have uh, the process, what's called the EGMOD, which exists at the Financial Action Task Force level. And in a lot of countries, that exists only so you can share intelligence. But if you're actually trying to prosecute or convict a case, you can get that information only through a signed treaty. And so to think about, especially for beneficial ownership, how to, you know, I, I would actually recommend governments to sort of use this opportunity at this forum because the State Department is hosting it to talk about how to facilitate information exchanges in this, how to make sure that you know data, the databases you're building are actually mutually compatible to exchange. Because that's the big thing you start realizing is that when each database is created so differently that that becomes hard. And so sort of talking about and thinking those through and you know, you sending a delegation to talk to that is, is an incredibly valuable exercise because I cannot tell you the number of governments in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia that I've heard this from, is that like when the US sets up the register, what do we do? Because we don't know how to, and, and this is true everywhere. On the second issue of how do you force it, I think very often the indirect route to it is making sure that is referenced or influenced in that country's fat of mutual evaluation. And depending on the country context you are in, now there is an opportunity for non-government actors for the very first time since about 2020 to input into the process. Unfortunately, because of the way FATF works, they will disclose your name to the government if you submit it. And so you have to be in a space where essentially you are not under threat to do that. So you know, I often feel comfortable doing it in for certain countries, but I'm aware in other countries where I work that it'll be very damaging to people on the ground if I send in that kind of information because my name will be sent to the government, my organization's name. And so, but I think indirect ways, because that's what motivates a lot of governments to put, for example, like South Africa right now, is rushing to get beneficial ownership passed because they've been put on the gray list. And so this is a long-term strategy, but reporting on it, getting, getting enough analysis done that it reflects, because a lot of the levers, the pressure levers for beneficial ownership comes at that international level. Um, it can alternatively come through the EITI mechanism, but none of those have the same impact as the mutual evaluation, because the consequence of that is that banking transactions become harder, 
Um, they become more expensive for your country. And for the first time, we've seen that happen with the UAE. And so that forced the UAE to put in a legislation, put in beneficial ownership. The second fight is now trying to get to see if that actually is effective. But, but that is the strongest pathway that you actually have. Sorry. Um, can you, especially from the law enforcement perspective, kind of speak to the need for international government collaboration or even just intrastate or federal collaboration in creating standardized data systems and what that means from a technological perspective, especially as we talk about constant restraint restrictions, um, both in funding and otherwise, uh, personnel, just kind of the big picture of this huge transformation that needs to happen on both the centralized and decentralized basis, sort of, so to speak. Uh, working together um, as partners is always a challenge. Um, obviously, even within the federal government, it's hard to work together with other offices. There are always sort of jurisdictional issues that get raised from time to time, uh, and there are other roadblocks that are thrown up, sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes not so well-intentioned. Um, we are trying to work very closely with uh, state and local governments um, in, in uh, look, going after pandemic relief fraud. And so we're making some efforts there. Uh, the Department of Justice is working internationally. But again, in my experience in international affairs is um, that's even harder to work together, as you point out. These are real problems. Obviously, from a law enforcement perspective, if we could work seamlessly with other countries and uh, you know our partners in the states and local governments and uh, our partners across the world, we would love to do that because there are real corrupt individuals, and not just corrupt individuals, but corrupt organizations that are taking advantage of uh, innocent um, uh, victims, and, um, and we need to go after that effectively. Obviously, more cooperation would be better, but, um, but uh, we still live in the real world and we have to deal with these. Thank you. A good question. Any other questions, folks? All right, well, we're actually at time. So we appreciate you listening in, and thank you very much. <laughs>